Okay, so my name is Tomislav and I've been a JavaScript developer in, uh, in Finum for two years now and I'm mm -hmm. going to talk a bit about some new up-and-coming CSS features. So namely I'm going to talk about the CSS grid and CSS variables. So let's start things off with CSS grid. So I'm going to start by talking about grids in general. So if you ever developed uh, or sliced the website, you encounter some grids. Uh, grids are one of the most often used components in web development, mainly front-end. Uh, and basically every site has them. So it's a real shame that CSS still doesn't have a release specification for it. So if you constructed some grids, you probably use some vendor tools for it, such as Suzy, Bootstrap Foundation or 960. And they really work cool, some of them work better than others, but they're actually uh, hacks hidden behind some cool utility features or mix-ins such as they're in Suzy. Uh, other than vendor tools, uh, people tend to use Flexbox for creating a grid and this, this works kind of okay but Flexbox isn't really meant for 2D components such as grids. It's meant for centering or, and uh, manipulating some more simple components. So you might run into some problems with time. So CSS grid. Uh, CSS grid is a specification for creating two-dimensional grids in CSS. It's currently in release candidate status, uh, which means it's being currently implemented in most browsers and probably won't change majorly. Some minor differences may occur uh, once some browsers run into potential errors and stuff. Currently, it can be enabled uh, via flags in Chrome and Firefox, or if you're using a bleeding edge browser such as Chrome Canary, you can find it there and play around with it. So let's dive into some code. First, I want to talk about how to set up the basics of the grid. So I'm going to show you an example of this. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start with showing you the markup for it. So the markup is pretty simple. We're going to have a, a container class div with a class named grid and eight uh, children divs uh, with a class of grid item. So that's about it regarding the markup. Uh, we're gonna have also some boilerplate uh, CSS that doesn't really have anything to do with the grid, it's just so you can differentiate the grid items uh, more easily and to make things look better. Okay, uh, regarding the grid itself, this is what you, you, what you need to do to uh, create a basic grid. So you have to put the display rule to grid on the grid container. Uh, what this does is it creates a grid context for, for the grid so it, this actually acts uh, really similar to display flex as in the grid item with uh, the display grid on it acts like a grid container and all, all of its direct descendants are now grid items okay so after doing this we need to construct the grid to do this you first need the grid template columns rule how this works is you specify the number and the width of the grid of the grid template columns. Uh, so if you do something like this, uh, now we're creating a grid that has only one 150 pixel wide column. If you do it this, uh, this means we're going to have two 150 pixel wide columns. And for this example, we're going to have four 150 pixel columns. Okay, so here we've covered the columns. Uh, we need to create some rows. So we're going to use a grid template rows rule. This actually works exactly the same as grid template columns does uh, with one minor difference that you're not specifying the width, you're specifying the height of the rows, of course. So for this example, we're going to create four 150 pixel rows. Uh, it doesn't matter that we don't have enough uh, markup uh, items for this. Uh, the grid is going to align it. Uh, just the way it has to be aligned. So, uh, okay, so now we already have a basic grid, uh, but almost every grid has some gutters. So for this, we're gonna use a rule called grid gap. This is actually a shorthand for 
grid uh, column gap and grid row gap and since we're gonna have the uh, same value for both we're just gonna put this shorthand to 20 pixels so after we created the grid we go to the browser we can refresh this and as you can see the grid has already been built and this works great this is really cool but it's not really responsive since we set the static values for the column widths and for the row heights uh, it's going to remain this way on all screens so what we can do now is set the pixel values to any other relative value whichever you wish you probably want to use percentage in this case but I want to talk about a new unit unit that's being introduced with the CSS grid. It's called fractions. It's written as 1FR. What this means is this column is going to span for the one fracture, fraction of the entire available width of the grid. So if we want uh, four, uh, four columns that each take up one fraction, we do it like this. Now if we refresh, we see we have a fully responsive grid here. So this is pretty cool. If you want to change the structure of the grid, say that we want the middle column to span for two fractions, you just do this, refresh, and the grid has aligned itself according to, to the value. Okay. So other than this, uh, there are some cool functions that come with uh, CSS Grid, such as repeat. So this isn't really a dry way of, uh, of specifying the column widths. So for this, you can use the repeat function uh, that takes up two arguments. Uh, the first argument being the number of the time you, the number of time you want to repeat a value. Uh, so this is going to be four, and the second argument is the value you want to repeat. So for start we're going to put 150 pixels so now if we refresh uh, you can see that it's the same as it has been in the beginning but it's much more concise uh, other than repeat uh, you can there's a cool function for this just a second if you want uh, a separate column to be more responsive uh, you you have a min max function. What this does, it, uh, it uh, sets the minimal and the maximal value you want the grid to span from to. Uh, so if we write the minmax function, it takes two arguments. The first one is the minimal value, of course. Uh, we're going to set this to 100 pixels. And the second one is the max value. This is going to be set to 300 pixels. So if we save this, refresh, you can see that the column is now spanning to its maximal value since it's, it has a lot of free space. So this takes up 300 pixels. And as we have a smaller screen, it's going to shrink until it hits its smallest specified value of 100 pixels. And now it stops being responsive. So this is pretty cool. Uh, as you can see, uh, the CSS grid is really flexible in building the grid basics, but what about positioning and ordering? Well, there are two, uh, there's two types of positioning in CSS grid. Uh, the first one we're going to cover is positioning by line numbers. So this kind of positioning introduces us to a new term called grid line. A uh, grid line is any dividing line that makes the structure of the grid. It can be horizontal or vertical. It's uh, regarding positioning, it's equal to gutters in most grid frameworks. So I'm going to show an example of this. So the markup we're going to use uh, for light positioning is almost the same as the markup we used for the grid setup with one minor difference. Uh, the second grid item is going to have an extra class called special grid item so we can target it more easily. So what we want to do here is we want to make the second grid item span to, we actually want to create, make it look bigger. So we want it to span from here, from the second uh, vertical grid line to the fourth vertical grid line. Uh, 
and we want it to span from the first horizontal uh, grid line as it's spanning now to the third horizontal grid line. So how we do this, we use, uh, for, first for the columns, we use a, a rule called grid column, where we specify the starting grid line, uh, that's number two, and the ending grid line, which is number four. And for the rows, we have uh, a rule called grid row, it acts the same as grid column. So here we're gonna put a, the first grid line as the starting grid line and the third as the ending grid line. So now if we refresh, we see that the grid cell has stretched and all other grid items have adjusted accordingly. So what if we want to change the order of the grid items? So for this case, we're going to uh, move the second grid item to, to the first place or in the grid without changing the markup. Uh, we can do this with the order rule. So, if you specify a value for order, uh, if you want it to be early in the grid, you have to specify a small value. And since this, uh, this uh, rule uh, defaults to zero, such as it acts actually similar to z-index, you have to put all other grid items to a higher, to a higher number. So here we're going to make them uh, have order value of two. Now, if you refresh, you can see that it switched this place. So this is really powerful. Uh, if you want to switch something on a different device uh, with smaller uh, with smaller screen width, you just put this in a media query, and you don't have to touch the markup to to change the positioning completely. Okay. So other than this, uh, there's a second type of positioning. This is a really cool one. Uh, it's called positioning by template area or grid area. So this introduces us to a new term called grid area or template area. Uh, it's any total space of the grid surrounded by four grid lines and it can contain any number of grid cells. So it's basically any number of adjacent uh, grid items or grid cells that create a rectangle shape. So I'm going to show you an example of this. <clears throat> So the markup we're going to use for area positioning is a bit different than what we used for now. So this time we're going to have four grid items and they're going to be named more explicitly. So we're going to have the grid header, a grid, grid main, grid aside and grid footer. And we're going to try to create a small layout from this. So how we're going to do this is we're going to use the same uh, basic structure of the grid we had for now and we're going to use a rule called grid area for each one of the components. So for grid area you have to specify a label that you're going to use later to create uh, uh, to create the grid. So grid header area is going to have a label of header, main is going to be named main, a side is going to be called a side and footer is going to be called footer. So now we have a rule called grid template areas that we can use to build up the, the structure of the grid. So how this works, it's, it's really simple and intuitive. You almost draw a grid here in this rule. So since we want the header to span for entire four columns, you just repeat the header label four times in the first row. We want the main to span, span for three columns, just repeat it three times, side for one, and the footer is going to span for four columns, uh, the same as the header does. So now if we navigate to this, as you can see, it works perfectly. The, the grid respects the values. So if we want to change something here, it's really simple. Uh, let's say if you want the side to span for two columns, for two columns, you just write it instead of main, refresh, and it works. If for some reason you want to change the positioning of the header and the footer, you just change the labels and it works automatically. So this is really powerful. Okay, other than this, uh, let's cover some other useful properties that you should check out. Uh, grid auto columns and grid auto rows is really cool. It specifies the size of any grid tracks you didn't cover with grid template columns and grid template rows. 
Also, there's a number for a number of uh, rules that help you with uh, alignment that work uh, similar to those that you can find in Flexbox, and a number of shorthands that can help you with uh, easier uh, manipulating of the grid. So, when can you use this? Uh, as you can see, it's currently not available in any browsers except uh, IE and Edge, where they're available, where the grid is available with some uh, older syntax. Uh, but the good news is uh, it's gonna, it should be shipped to Firefox, Chrome and Edge in somewhere around March and other browsers should follow it soon after that. Uh, other than that, there are some polyfills like this I found from Premi Company. Uh, it uses JavaScript to render the grid, uh, so it works pretty good on desktops, but it can be slow on smaller devices. Uh, also, there are a couple of gotchas with some with working with some other rules such as position, as fix, fixed positioning and stuff like that. So I wouldn't use this in production since you're probably gonna have want to cover smaller devices for the grid. Also, if you want to play around uh, with the grid, I'd rather use uh, flags and play around with, play around with it locally. So that's that. Uh, so to conclude, while still a release candidate, it's a matter of time until this becomes the right way to do grids in CSS. Uh, as soon as some bigger companies start using it, uh, some better or and stronger polyfills will probably come up, so everyone else will be able to use it also. Uh, also, it seems a lot more powerful than other grids currently available in CSS. Okay, other than that, I want to talk about CSS variables or CSS custom properties as they are being called in the specification. So why to use variables in CSS? If you ever used uh, some preprocessors such as SAS or LESS, you know that they help you dry out the code and to better organize the properties you're using. Most often these properties are something like colors and font sizes, so you don't have to repeat them always and you can change them in one place site-wide. So this is the syntax for CSS grids. Here, uh, primary color variable is bound to the root pseudo element. Uh, by this, uh, it means it's uh, to bound to the global scope of the site. Uh, its syntax is prefixed by a double dash, and when you're calling, uh, when you you want to use this variable, you call it with a var function uh, that takes two arguments. The first one is the name of the variable and the second optional argument is the fallback value if the variable is empty in that scope. So, okay, this is cool, but how does this compare to preprocessor variables? Uh, if you're using preprocessor, why should you use uh, CSS variables? Where the difference is, uh, they're bound to CSS selectors and they cascade, so you can scope them to, uh, to let's say, some components. And also, the big thing is they can be changed at runtime via JavaScript or media queries or anything else. So this enables uh, responsive variable changes that aren't available with preprocessors. So if you want something to look uh, a lot different on a mobile phone, you can do it in one place with a simple media query. And also this uh, makes theming a lot easier, whether it's for entire websites or for just some simple components. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of this. Let's say you have a grid that has a column gap of 10 pixels and uh, a row gap double its size. And you want it to be smaller on smaller screens. So what you need to do is put a media query here and uh, override these values by hand. So while this works great, uh, it's not really not that maintainable, it's harder to read, and the values themselves aren't reusable later in the code. So this is how you would do it with CSS variables. You set the global gutter variable to 10 pixels, uh, you call it for grid column gap rule, and if you want the grid row gap to always be relative to the column gap, you can use the calc function and multiply, multiply the gutter value with whichever value you want. And later on smaller screens, smaller screens, you just uh, change the gutter variable value in a media query, and the CSS takes care of everything else. 
So regarding theming, uh, let's say that you have a button that uses the same color for borders, text, and the hover background color. Let's say you want to override these values for a different button theme, for a dark theme in this case. Uh, how do you do this? You have to rewrite the, the classes and uh, override them manu manually. So you have to put the values manually on all places to a different color. How you would do this with CSS variables? It's pretty simple. Uh, you set a color variable to, to the button scope to a value that you want and you just reference it in border color, color, background color and everywhere, anywhere else you want to use it. And later when you want to override this value you just create a new class and set the variable to, to a different value and everything else cascades accordingly. Other than this uh, you can manipulate the value of a variable with JavaScript. You access this value uh, as you would access any other any other rule uh, in CSS. So you can change this in runtime, manipulate it any way you want. So this opens the door to really different kinds of possibilities. Uh, regarding the browser compatibility, it's much better than with CSS Grid. It's still in development in Edge, but it's available in most other evergreen browsers. Uh, it's not available in IE, but if you're using it for some simple stuff, it's really easy to, f to write some fallback CSS. So the conclusion would be if, uh, if they fit your need, if you need to use, uh, if you need to re uh, change some variables responsibly or you need some theming or anything else, uh, and your browser supports allows it, uh, just use your CSS variables that they're really going to make stuff much easier for you. So thank you.